So far in our discussion of the second law of thermodynamics, we've talked about entropy in terms of heat transferred uh, in a reversible process to or from a system divided by absolute temperature. If the, say, the molecular theory were to be overturned, uh, say, tomorrow, and somebody were able to prove that molecules don't exist, thermodynamics would still be valid. So far in our development, uh, we haven't uh, introduced any particular model. These are just general things we're talking about. However, if you believe, and most scientists do, that matter is composed of atoms and molecules, then you can uh, give a statistical interpretation of entropy. I'll just briefly introduce this at this part of the course, and then toward the end of the course we'll talk more about it in the topic statistical mechanics, or sometimes called statistical thermodynamics. But first, here's a preview. This is the important equation. S, that's the entropy, absolute entropy. That's just not entropy change, delta S, but that's the absolute entropy is K log omega. Let's define a few things here. A K is the gas constant R divided by Avogadro's number. So essentially it's a molecular or an atomic gas constant. This is per mole, K will be per molecule. And omega is the number of ways a particular state of a system can be obtained. So if you have more than one way, or a lot of ways to obtain a system, then omega is large and the entropy will be large. As I said, there's going to be more about this in the third part of the course when we talk about statistical thermodynamics. So let's develop this idea a little in a little way. All right, let's take a particular volume and let's divide this volume up into four areas. Let's call this A, B, C, and D. And now we're going to introduce the a molecular picture, the molecular model. And we have, say, four atoms. And we'll call this one, two, three, four. And now what we're going to do is to introduce some sort of constraint. That's typically what you do in statistical mechanics, is you have some constraint introduced into a system. So first of all, let's say that all atoms have to be in volume A. This, what we're leading up to is that experiment we talked about last time where you have helium on one side and argon on the other separated by a partition. If you remove the partition, then argon will diffuse into the helium space and the helium will diffuse in the argon space and that always goes one direction. You never see argon collecting at one side of the container and helium on the other. Let's make this constraint. All atoms have to be in a position A. So let's look at number of ways subject to that constraint. And again, what we're doing is looking at number of ways of getting a particular state of a system. So we can put molecule one, two, three, four in there. We can't put any molecules B, C, or D because they all have to be in A by this particular constraint. I guess I'm confusing one with one. So just let's call, let's see, one A. Uh, what else do we have here? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Let's call, call this something. All right. So how many ways can you get this state with all of them in A? Well, there's just one way to get that. You put everything in A. This means that the entropy S is K log of zero, I'm uh, sorry, log of one, I'm anticipating what the answer will be, log one, and log of one is zero. So the entropy, when you can, everything is constrained to be in a particular volume, the entropy there is zero. Now, we don't have a symbol yet, but now let's say all atoms have to be in either A or B. So now we're increasing the volume available for these one, two, three, and four labeled atoms, we can now be in A and B. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's keep track of the number of ways we can get this, A, B, C, and D. Well, we can have molecule one and two in A and three and four in B. And of course, we're constraining them. They can't be in C or D. We can put molecule one and three in A and two and four in B. We've got molecule one and four here, and then two and three here. Or we can put molecule three and four there, and atoms one and two there, two and four on the left, 
one and three on the right, and two and three on the left, and one and four on the right. So this has a total of six different ways of arranging things. Now those of you who have had statistics, maybe you recognize this, a equation in order to calculate the number of ways you can arrange things. That would be, let's use again the symbol omega, which by the way, some textbooks use W. So we'll use, some people use W, I guess fear of Greek letters. Omega equals, in this case, six. But the general case will be n factorial over n1 factorial, n2 factorial, n3 factorial, and n4 factorial. So n here is the total, in this case we're using atoms, total number of atoms. This is number of atoms in the first box. Actually, might as well just do A, B, C, D. Might as well do that to be consistent in our notation in a box A. Number of molecules in box B, C, and D. Those of you familiar, n factorial is equal to n times n minus one times n minus two and so on, all the way down to one. And also zero factorial is defined to equal one. And here's the total number of atoms. There are four atoms. So this would be a six, a four factorial. And this is definition, four factorial then will be four times three times two times one. The number of molecules in box A will be two. That's our constraint. So that'd be two times one factorial is two times one. And also the number of molecules would be two times one. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if that calculation works. So for our first constraint, all in A, we have the number of ways of getting that will be four factorial. And they're all in A, so this has to be four factorial divided by four factorial times zero in B, times zero in C, times zero in D. That's an exclamation point, and that's what that is. Calculate this out. These are all equal to one, four, that's just equal to one. Now let's put two in A and two in B. Omega for that case would be four factorial. We still have four numbers divided by two factorial in A, two factorial in B, zero factorial in C, and zero factorial in D. And this is equal to six. Let's look at now, go back to our system here. Now our constraint is we can have molecules in A, B, or C. Okay, so we can have in three of the four containers. So that means omega can be equal to four factorial. And if we can have it in A, B, and C, A or B or C has to be one there, one there, and two in the other. So this will be equal to one in one, two in the other, and then one in one. This is just the number of different ways here. One in that, one factorial, and then zero factorial in D. This comes out to be 12. And finally, this is the mo no constraints whatsoever, or sorry, the constraints will be, sorry, uh, the constraint will be one molecule there, one molecule there, one molecule there, and one molecule there. Okay, so the constraint is one in each one of those. So the number of ways we can get that is four factorial over one in the first box, one in the second box, one in the third box, and one in the fourth box and that's equal to 24. So which has the most entropy? Where all the molecules are confined to be in a particular volume at one box, or whether the molecules can spread out and occupy all the boxes? Well, clearly, since S is equal to K log W, or K log omega, I guess we're using omega, sorry, K log omega, largest omega implies largest entropy. S. So clearly that has the largest entropy. So when there are no constraints on the system, so none whatsoever, and if you just extrapolate from these to gas molecules, it's more, you have more ways of obtaining a system if you can spread out the gas molecules through the entire volume, rather than just confining them into a particular region. So remember in argon, and helium example we had before, entropy of mixing, we had argon here, 
and helium here. When we remove this partition, argon now will spread out, helium will spread out, and the entropy will increase. Another way of saying that is when you remove this partition, argon now spread out through the entire volume is going to a more probable state, and helium spread out over the entire volume, as opposed to confined here, is going to a more probable state. So as you go to a more probable state, and a more probable state means that you have many more ways of getting that state that's more probable, that means that that is the direction of spontaneity. That's where things will go, just out of you know, probability. If something's more probable, yeah, it'll probably happen, rather than something that's not uh, as probable. So it's more probable that you'll have the gas molecules spread out through the entire container that has the largest number of ways of getting it, and since systems tend to go to a more probable state and entropy increases with a more probable state, ta-da! Entropy increases in spontaneous processes where a system goes from a less probable state to a more probable state. And so that's the whole point of the statistical interpretation of entropy. It explains why spontaneous processes happen. Systems just go from a low probability state to a high probability state. They hardly ever go, and we'll find out they never go, practically, from a high probability state to a low probability state. Let's do one more example to illustrate the statistical interpretation of thermodynamics. Let's take a system where you can have three energy levels. Let's call this energy zero, energy one, and energy two. And we'll have a system consisting of four molecules. These are energy levels predicted by quantum mechanics. Uh, you remember from introductory chemistry, there's not continuous energy levels for molecular systems, but they're in fact discrete energy levels. We'll learn more about these energy levels in the second part of the course when we talk about quantum mechanics. All right, let's make a constraint, say that the total energy has to equal zero. That's our constraint. What does that mean? The only way to get total energy equal to zero is to put all four gas molecules down here. That's the only way to get that. This implies that the number of ways of obtaining that system, omega, is equal to one, or the entropy, which is k log omega, that is equal to zero. So constraining all the molecules to be in a particular energy level gives you an entropy of zero. Well, to get all the molecules in the lowest energy state, this implies that you have T is equal to zero, and we'll learn more about that. Temperature equal to zero. This means at temperature equals zero, entropy is equal to zero. And so we're presaging the third law of thermodynamics, which states that at absolute zero, the entropy of a pure crystalline substance is equal to zero. Now let's make the constraint that the total energy has to equal, let's say, four. So how many ways can you get that? So now they don't have to be in the lowest energy level. They can be in other energy levels. Well, one way to get E equal total energy equal four is to put two molecules up here and two molecules there. Another way to get the energy of total energy of four is to put four molecules in the energy equal one. One, two, three, four. So in this case, omega is equal to two, or s is equal to k natural log of omega, or natural log, just let's say put a two there. So when you remove the constraint that all the molecules have to be in the lowest energy level, entropy increases. So you start at temperature equals zero, absolute zero Kelvin, the entropy is zero. As you start increasing the temperature, you allow more energy levels to be accessible, and you could rearrange the system more, more, many more times when you have more energy levels accessible, so the entropy increases as you increase the temperature. So as I said, we'll have more about this in the third part of the course when you talk about statistical thermodynamics, but I hope by giving you a general idea of how one interprets entropy in terms of the molecular theory.